the regional director for the world, Mr. Danny Kaye. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I have no method of making a report about 643 million children received uh, 4,187 liters translated insofar as the insufficient quartz dedicated to the incredible kind of uh, liter quality, which of course has not had the vitamized process of uh, our, our milk distribution. But in a sense, that has not yet come to the um, uh, attention of those, and so we feel more or less that they have, and uh, we should continue on uh, the basis of uh, not so much in so far as we can, but that they can, in a sense, realize their true value. Now, I'd like to see what the interpreters are going to do with that. <laughs> I call the meeting to order. Interpretation is crucial, absolutely central to what we do. We're dealing with political ideas. We're dealing with proposed policies. They are things of substance, but they have no life other than in the words in which they're expressed and in which they're negotiated. And when you're dealing with that kind of uh, debate or argument in different languages, the only way in which we can fully understand each other and have a fighting chance of getting to a conclusion is through clear understanding of the words. And the people who deliver that to us are the interpreters. El intérprete en muchos casos es no solamente indispensable para este diálogo y para esta negociación, sino que es un aliado del delegado que está exponiendo en un momento dado una idea muy concreta. Los intérpretes son, son bien evidentemente mis aliados. ¿Y eh, por qué? Porque ellos permiten hacer en sorte que las posiciones que yo exprime sean comunicadas eh, a otros. La esencia de la diplomacia es la comunicación, el hecho de hacer pasar un cierto número de informaciones a otros. Y después de discutir, de discutir, de elaborar los compromisos, la esencia de la diplomacia no es la confrontación. Donc, euh, il est tout à fait essentiel que euh, les intentions soient bien perçues, les significations des mots soient exactes. Euh, donc, je trouve que le travail d'un interprète est un travail d'allié.这个时候的话呢非常更加重要的就叫一定要准确一个字都不能拉一个含义都不能够歪一定要这个含义有时候非常非常微妙的稍微一点小的含义的不同整个意思就可能有很大的不同那么不管是那种社交场合还是坐下
لابد أن يشعر بنوع من الإطمئنان للترجمة وكذلك أحيانا بالإعجاب The dramatic changes engendered by the end of the Cold War. Those efforts. Pourrait s'éteindre rapidement en étant plus un bon interprète, c'est un mélange de connaissances académiques et de qualité personnelle. To be an interpreter, you have to be able to um, adopt this particular kind of mental stance, which enables you to draw back enough to be able to see both of these processes, the ingoing information and your outgoing information happening at the same time without getting mixed up in either of them. An interpreter has to have, call it whatever you want, but he or she has to have something special. We call it a gift, we call it a talent. Quick reflex, good memory. Uh, I think the willingness to learn, you have to listen, speak, forget, listen again, speak and forget. When you play tennis, you hit one shot and you're ready for the next shot. If you think about the first shot, you miss the second shot. It's not a trade, it's, a, it's an art uh, where you need specialized training. Very often people think that uh, interpreters are like parrots. They work automatically without thinking. They don't have to understand the subject matter. Nothing could be more wrong. Unless you do understand what the speaker is saying, unless you, see, uh, you understand his ideas, you cannot interpret. As the Second World War came to an end, the Allied victors vowed never to allow the recurrence of so tragic an episode in history. The United States, the Soviet Union, Great Britain, France, and China gathered to write the charter for a new organization dedicated to saving future generations from the scourge of war. They established the United Nations organization. My uncle André was an interpreter. When the war ended, the San Francisco Conference, which created the UN, took place in June uh, 45. And my uncle was one of the interpreters, consecutive, of course, in those days. Uh, the UN uh, set up in London. Uh, this is when Jean Herbert started assembling a team, which had, of course, uh, Major Le Bosque. Uh, which had uh, Georges Rabinovich, it had my, f my uncle, and very soon after that, my father. J'ai eu le plaisir en dé décembre 1945 de recevoir un télégramme que j'ai toujours émanant de Gladwin Jeb, qui n'était pas encore Sir Gladwin, mais qui était déjà chargé d'organiser la première assemblée générale qui s'est tenue à Londres de janvier à Euh, milieu février 1946. Le chef interprète à l'époque s'appelait Jean Herbert. J'avais déjà été désigné par Jean Herbert pour travailler lors des réunions secrètes qui se tenaient dans la suite occupée par Stettinius, secrétaire d'État des États-Unis, à l'hôtel Carlton. Il y avait là des séances secrètes qui réunissaient les quatre grands, Non, c'était les cinq grands, parce que la Chine avait été ajoutée et qui n'était pas présente à Berlin. Pour désigner le premier secrétaire général de l'organisation. Tout au début, la France avait préféré SPAC, mais on avait donné à SPAC la présidence de la première session de l'Assemblée générale. C'est à ce moment-là que diverses candidatures furent proposées, et je crois utile de rappeler que l'une d'elles, c'était celle de... Euh, Pearson, le Canadien. La candidature de euh, Trigvelli fut proposée et euh, acceptée sans difficulté. 
In consecutive interpretation, the interpreter is seated near the rostrum, taking notes on the speech being delivered. Once a speaker has completed a speech in one language, the interpreter renders the speech into another language from the rostrum. This was the only method used at the League of Nations and at the beginning of the United Nations. Two of the most famous consecutive interpreters were the Kamen Care brothers, André and Georges. In consecutive, my uncle would be sitting there holding his head uh, like that on the desk, listening intently, not being disturbed by anything. And the speech could be an hour, could be an hour and 15 minutes, could be an hour and a half. Uh, and then he would give it in the other language. And uh, very often people doubted because they themselves, the, the, the listeners, didn't even think uh, didn't even remember all that had been said in the original language, so they themselves could not check whether he had said everything. Uh, but it's been compared from the notes from the verbatim reporters, from tapes and so forth, and it was absolutely, he, he never forgot anything. My father, on the contrary, had a completely different uh, thing. My father did take notes, but not words. He used a system whereby he was drawing uh, caricatures or portraits of people around him. He was quite good with his pencil, quite good. At the end of the meeting, uh, he would take that home and, and arrange it, finish it, do it well, and bring it back and have the delegate sign it. This was the first uh, time I was interpreting uh, André Kromiko uh, from Russian into English. Gromyko had a uh, a rather fearsome um, reputation among the interpreters and um, so I approached this uh, uh, task with fear and trembling and uh, a, um, a ritual phrase came up in Gromyko's uh, statement uh, reduction and regulation of uh, armaments and uh, the first time I had to repeat that, I, uh, um, <laughs> instead of saying reduction and regulation of uh, armaments, I said reduction and regulation of arguments. And apparently, uh, Gromyko laughed at that and said that would not be a bad idea. And then, when uh, I, I finished my interpretation, this was, of course, a consecutive, and it was about, uh, let's say, lasted half an hour or so. Uh, Gromyko, I remember, raised his pencil and said in Russian, I want to call attention to a good interpretation. Uh, the Nuremberg trials began uh, in the autumn of 1945. The trial of war criminals, of major war criminals, the, one, the ones everybody knows about, I mean, Goering, Kalten, Brunner, uh, Ribbentrop, uh, and all those people. It, it was a premiere doing simultaneous interpretation. Uh, it had been used on other occasions, even before the war, but a full-scale operation with four working languages, English, French, Russian, German, that was unheard of. And by the way, uh, many people thought it would not work. It was Colonel Dostert, previously the in private interpreter of Eisenhower, which, uh, who organized a team, uh, managed to have an appropriate system built, and it was used during the Nuremberg trial because uh, it facilitated, obviously, the uh, proceedings and shortened them. Uh, dès mon arrivée, on m'a emmené dans la, la salle du tribunal, dans les galeries du public. J'ai regardé de très loin, donc tous ces personnages, les, le bloc des accusés d'un côté, les juges, les avocats d'un autre, et au fond de la salle, les interprètes derrière des parois vitrées. J'ai regardé, n'en croyant pas mes yeux, me disant, ça n'est pas possible, ça n'est pas humainement faisable, il doit y avoir un, un artifice quelconque. Simultaneous equipment was not what it is now. 
the headphones were uh, extremely, the earphones were very, very heavy. Nous n'avions aucun microphone pour les trois interprètes de la même langue, un énorme microphone très lourd qui avait l'air d'une grenade à main. Il fallait donc se passer très vite. Et nous étions divisés en, en équipes selon les langues. Le son devait être épouvantable parce que nous étions assis, donc trois par langue, pour l'anglais le russe et l'allemand vers le français, je parle de mon groupe à moi. Ensuite, venait une toute petite paroi en verre, euh, comme celle qui séparait autrefois les caissiers dans les banques. Interpreters must see the speakers. And this is why our boots, what was called the aquarium, because it was all made of glass, were very close to the defendants. We could see every detail of their face and therefore understand the way the mind was working. J'étais complètement braqué sur le travail lui-même, l'aspect technique du travail. Je m'étais détaché du contenu psychologique. Peut-être étais-je dans une certaine mesure insensibilisé par quatre années de, de vie à Paris sous l'occupation allemande. Je ne peux pas dire que je ressentais un sentiment de, de revanche, ni rien de ce genre, ou que j'avais de l'hostilité pour le, les Allemands. I can tell you about Genia Rosov, who was one of the greatest interpreters I've ever met. She had been at Ravensbrück, and she managed to uh, stand it. She, she, she worked extremely well, in spite of all the stress it, it meant for her. Other people reacted in another way. I know a colleague who had uh, to give up he went back to the translation department. He couldn't stand it anymore. It was a, a terrible experience for those who had seen the, these atrocities. What languages would be used by the United Nations? To the five originally agreed upon by the signatories of the Charter, English, French, Spanish, Russian, and Chinese, a sixth, Arabic was added in the 1970s. A system to allow oral communication in several languages had to be developed. At the time of the League of Nations, they refused the system. And it was uh, only after it was adopted in Nuremberg that uh, during the first General Assembly in London, uh, the delegate of Ukraine, Manuilski, mentioned that concomitantly there was the Nuremberg trial and uh, we should have the best delegates representing their nation and not those who were fluent in foreign languages. This uh, was a proposal and it was adopted by the General Assembly in uh, London and they decided to send a mission to Nuremberg in order to find out how it worked. When I received the telegram from the stair, he, he had negotiated a, uh, a contract to hire 20 interpreters and uh, a staff of four, including himself. And uh, he had rented space in, uh, in uptown, here uptown Manhattan, Hunter College. The task was to get together a team to uh, train them and get them ready to function as a, a, and service one committee during the General Assembly, which was to uh, take place during the fall of 1946. So we had about three months or so to do this. Now, first, we had to get the bodies. Une équipe de choc composée de trois des meilleurs interprètes, Georges Klebnikov, Georges Vasitchikov et Genia Rozov, qui ont été détachés de Nuremberg pour venir à New York, aux Nations Unies, démontrer les avantages du système simultané. Uh, I had heard consecutive interpreters at work and I felt sure I was not qualified to do that, but I was sort of without further ceremony put in the booth and given something to interpret. 
Unfortunately, I had no technical problems at all with the process, which at the time was a key point because it was still considered uh, rather miraculous that people could even do this at all. Some people had never interpreted, so the, the pure mechanics of interpreting were a problem, but for almost everybody, the subject matter. So uh, the training consisted in using uh, verbatim reports of speeches, uh, texts, <coughs> and uh, similar materials, and having mock sessions. I went to see uh, Colonel Leon Duster. He gave me a test, the test being, the test consisting of somebody reading from the verbatim record of meetings in Russian and in French, and asked me to interpret same. Uh, so I was just thrown in, uh, I dove in and um, and I started interpreting. Some people had excellent voices, excellent diction, and uh, also all the intelligence and all the linguistic qualifications they were top notch. Some people, despite very excellent qualifications, were not suitable as interpreters. The stair had set up a, a trial run, uh, a demonstration run, shortly before the assembly, had invited all sorts of personalities from the Secretariat and whoever was around from delegations. And we had set up a, uh, a uh, room as, uh, with booths and uh, all the necessary arrangements. And uh, then Murphy's law took over and everything went wrong. Everything went so wrong that, I mean, as, as is typical of machinery, the, uh, the amplifier didn't work, the uh, earphones were disconnected, the microphones wouldn't open, everything happened. One team was set up for the fifth or budgetary committee, and that was the only team that was sort of ready and able to go. But very soon thereafter, the committees began to uh, realize the huge advantage of uh, <coughs> simultaneous interpretation in terms of speed and uh, etc., and began clamoring for interpreters. And then teams were made up helter skelter and assigned to this or that committee. For that, any speech speech of uh, an hour it meant that you had to spend another almost two hours interpreting it uh, into uh, two languages as if it was let's say in Russian or, or Spanish so obviously the, the simultaneous interpretation uh, had all the advantages uh, for everybody. Initially it was felt to be a source of wonderment that anybody could sit at a microphone and simply so fluently pass from one language into another. What was interesting to many people was also that there was a lot of, there were a lot of young people doing this, uh, and not only men, uh, as before in the consecutive but, uh, time, but women and young women. It was the only possible system for an organization like this with the use of so many languages. The UN started out with two working languages, English and French, and th uh, three additional, which were Russian, Spanish, and Chinese. The consecutive interpreters, <coughs> in other words, people who listen to a speech, take notes, then get up and give an interpretation on that basis, were very much against simultaneous interpretation being introduced. Our leadership, you know, Jean Herbert, Kamenker, you know, the people from the League of Nations, uh, uh, you know, had this uh, attitude of some contempt for les téléphonistes, <laughs> as they used to refer to them. The, the rivalry between the two groups, the simultaneous and consecutive interpretation group at that time, was, 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 was quite intense. Both Doster and Herbert were eased out, and uh, Rabinovich, who was a consecutive interpreter, became the chief of both, and then the services. Uh, then we discovered that all the consecutive interpreters could do simultaneous, and naturally all the simultaneous, especially the best ones, like George Sherry, 
to dis discover that they can do consecutive very well. And, and the thing that one mustn't forget, and that is that the existence of the profession as we know it, is in fact determined by those beginnings, in other words, Nuremberg and UN. The 1950s and 1960s brought dramatic change. It was the beginning of the Cold War era, and the United Nations played a key role in peacekeeping and decolonization. It was also a time of intense political and ideological debate between East and West. This type of missile shows a launching area being constructed near the city of Vamp. The Soviet delegation was sitting right in front of me there. There was Khrushchev in the middle. Uh, and uh, there was Gromyko on the far side, I remember. Prime Minister Macmillan was on the rostrum, making his, uh, I think by now, reasonably famous speech of uh, the winds of change sweeping across Africa. Khrushchev listened. He was getting the whole business through uh, the courtesy of the Russian interpreter. And he became progressively more and more agitated as uh, the speech was being delivered. And then at some point he started hammering with his hand on the table, and um, no notice was taken of that by the president. But Khrushchev obviously wanted to make a point of order. He took off his shoe and banged with it on the table. And that, of course, brought the house down, total consternation throughout. And Khrushchev, whom I could barely hear through the window, because he was not speaking into an open microphone, he was just standing there in the middle of a hall. And he was, what I thought he said was, I shall not permit you to engage in capitalist propaganda here. I thought I grasped that, opened my mic, <laughs> and said that in English into the microphone. Macmillan, who had uh, not worn his earphone because he was speaking himself, or perhaps it sort of got knocked off when he leaned back, and so he said, well, I wish somebody would translate that for me. I was in the Russian booth, interpreting from English and French into Russian. Here comes the first speech by President Kennedy in the United Nations. And, as it's usual, we naturally don't get the speech in advance. Uh, get it about, uh, about uh, seven, eight minutes before he started. I suddenly see, in the middle of the speech, uh, a quotation, which I could see is from Boris Godunov. It was the part where Boris Godunov gives orders that all the borders should be uh, closed up because uh, the uh, false pretender appeared in, in Poland and Lithuania and that one shouldn't allow uh, these agents to come in, so all the borders should be... And so uh, Kennedy was quoting this uh, to tell the Russians, the Soviets, off for closing their borders. But this is from Boris Grunov, from Pushkin, in the English translation. But I have to do it into Russian. And I imagine uh, my situation, if I have to give my pedestrian, you know, very poor uh, translation of what's supposed to be Pushkin, and everybody naturally uh, learned this in school. So I was really very upset and asked my colleague, Mary Jacob, uh, please go over to the library and see whether you can get a taller. You know. Kennedy begins to speak, I interpret, and sweating blood, really, because I know it, it's coming. Why will I do it? And um, she doesn't appear. Finally, a guard comes in and brings me a piece of type text with this text. And so when it came, I read it nicely. When she came back, the guard wouldn't let her in because she didn't have her pass. She left it in the boot. At the beginning of the 70s, it was the height of the Cold War and in some ways the UN was treading water, waiting to see what would happen in our world. So what we saw was great oratory, great ideological combats, and the interpreters had to deal with that and deal with very much longer speeches. People would go on for a long, long time. 
during the Indo-Pakistani war. When Ali Bhutto was making his, his speech, and he got so excited and he got so carried away that he tore up his speech and started just ad-libbing and saying, you're tearing my country apart like I'm tearing this piece of paper. And he started crying, literally crying. And I started literally crying. I just couldn't go on. We were starting to move away from that kind of confrontation, uh, although it wasn't over, and more technical subjects were coming to the UN. So the interpreters uh, had to start to go down the path of dealing much more with things to do with science and uh, technology and environment. I found I liked the Outer Space Committee. We saw cosmonauts and astronauts in meetings and uh, it was a fascinating opportunity to just be there in a committee which at that time wasn't involved in politics. This was still Cold War era, and yet outer space somehow was free of politics. It was nuts and bolts, science, outer space technology, and how do we preserve outer space for future generations? Prenez par exemple un expert nucléaire. Uh, prenez un un juriste extrêmement euh, euh, se spécialisant dans une matière, je ne dis pas confidentielle, mais très précise. Il ne sera pas forcément un linguiste, il n'aura pas forcément à sa disposition les termes techniques dans l'autre langue. Donc euh, là, il est évident que les gouvernements ont une liberté de manœuvre et une possibilité d'efficacité bien plus grande que s'il n'y avait pas euh, des interprètes. Now in the 90s, with the Cold War behind us, uh, the great flourishes of oratory uh, really heard much less ideology, much less mortal combat, and you know, much more uh, talk uh, consistent with what happened in the, in the middle of this period, much, much more talk about practical, material, technological things. Il suffit de voir l'évolution de l'ordre du jour de l'Organisation des Nations Unies pour voir comment a évolué le travail de l'interprète. Et je m'avance peut-être un peu, je dirais que cette interdépendance a peut-être aussi donné naissance à un nouveau type de diplomate. L'éloquence diplomatique change, de même que l'éloquence politique a changé. Euh, je crois qu'il y a moins de ce qu'on appelle en français d'effet de manche, d'effet oratoire, euh, plus euh, de technicité, plus de recours à un certain nombre d'arguments bien construits. Interpreters and diplomats work together all the time and we need each other in, in the work that we're all trying to accomplish and uh, of course the diplomats are the principals in the work that they are trying to accomplish and we are merely a link in the communications chain but uh, in many instances uh, we do become more of a member of the team, so to speak, and especially when we are, work away from headquarters. I've been working with the UN negotiations to find a solution to the Georgian Abkhaz conflict, and I've been working as the personal interpreter to the uh, special representative of the Secretary General for Georgia. And these negotiations have taken place in Georgia, Abkhazia, Geneva, <laughs> New York, Moscow, Sochi, and it's been a very long and interesting process accompanied by the sending of a UN observer mission to Abkhazia. In the field missions, again, I, I feel that that is where the interpreters can be the most, most versatile. And since the end of the Cold War, our uh, field missions have uh, diversified. For example, we have uh, uh, the peacekeeping operations are not only uh, the classical peacekeeping operations, but they have become multifunctional so that they have an electoral component or a human rights component, uh, administ civilian administrations. And uh, the, uh, many interpreters have participated in, in, in these field uh, operations very successfully. Uh, there have been times where I've been in a booth. There have been times where it's pure consecutive. Most of the time it's modified consecutive or whispering chuchotage. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of these meetings and such work is that you're really not interpreting language, you're interpreting cultures. 
what is very important for the interpreter, I feel, is to remain absolutely neutral and that regardless of your personal sympathies or your views, you are neutral. It was a mission uh, that was sent to Kuwait after the Gulf War, something like three or four days after the end of the Gulf War. We were driven to Kuwait City. Uh, and I was accompanying the, the human rights component of the mission who were going to ascertain what happened, find out about the violations of international humanitarian law. It was quite different and difficult on very many levels. Here we, at the UN, we are used to very well-structured statements. And there, it was people who were personally hurt people who were personally grieving over something, over a real tangible loss. They were angry. They were sad. They were telling stories of what had happened, how their houses were, were, uh, were ransacked, how things were taken away from them, how sadly some people were very badly injured or even killed. I couldn't just stand there with somebody standing next to me, flailing their arms, shouting at the top of their voices, uh, being very emphatic about what they're saying and then uh, at the end of their three sentences I would just turn around and say in very proper very calm English you know, well the gentleman has had his house burnt down and two of his kids were beaten up but uh, that would be totally ridiculous so, and all of a sudden I was identifying with my <laughs> with the with the ones who were speaking a lot more than I had ever done uh, before there are several things that make um, a meeting in the Security Council um, memorable or, or interesting or challenging. One is the actual event itself. Uh, I remember very much a meeting in the summer of 1988, and that was when Ambassador Li Luye uh, was presiding in the Security Council. And he was reading a presidential statement, which I was delivering in English, which indicated that there was going to be a formal ceasefire between Iraq and Iran. And this was after about eight years of a protracted uh, fratricidal war that took a great toll on both Iran and Iraq. And as I was reading this, I really felt that I was observing an important moment in history. Les gens souvent parlent vite, ne se rendent pas compte, on oublie qu'ils sont uh, traduits. An interpreter has to think before he or she speaks. We can't speak faster than we think. If a text is read at a top speed, it's absolutely impossible for us to be able to understand, think, and render a good interpretation. La difficulté devient encore plus grande quand l'orateur, sûr de son texte écrit, parle à une vitesse insupportable. Je dis bien insupportable, même pour ceux qui l'écoutent dans l'original. Um, the speakers have less time to speak. They're given five minutes and they cram 15 minutes worth into five minutes. We also know that reporters uh, are, are taking uh, quotes and material directly from the interpretation without waiting for a record to come out the following day. To know that every word you're saying is being uh, piped in live to CNN and, uh, and headline news and all over the world. I mean, it was just I mean, an incredible amount of pressure. Today, conference interpretation is a recognized profession. Many universities around the world offer postgraduate programs in interpretation and translation. Some of the best known are the School of Translation and Interpretation at the University of Geneva. Azit the School of Interpretation and Translation at the University of Sorbonne, EZIT, the Institute of Interpretation and Translation of Paris, Georgetown University, and the Monterey Institute in the United States, and the Al Al Soon Language School in Cairo. Former United Nations programs at the Beijing Foreign Studies University and at the first Moscow State Institute of Foreign Languages contributed significantly to the training of Russian and Chinese interpreters. There are also schools in Vienna, Trieste, and Heidelberg. The International Association of Conference Interpreters, IEC, is the only international organization of interpreters in the world. Uh, L'Association Internationale des Interprètes de Conférences 
dont le sigle est AIC en français, a été créée en 1953 à Paris. Et elle a pour objectif de défendre la profession d'interprète de conférence. L'AIC compte quelques 2500 membres dans 68 pays dans le monde entier. Elle regroupe des interprètes de conférences dont certains sont des permanents, c'est-à-dire des fonctionnaires des organisations internationales, et d'autres sont des freelances, ou pour parler en bon français, des interprètes indépendants. It all began with a small informal meeting of three great pre-war interpreters. Andronikov, who was the head interpreter at the French Foreign Ministry, there was the famous André Caminquer, uh, who, who was certainly one of the best interpreters of, of his time. And uh, the third one uh, was uh, Hans Jacob, who was head interpreter at UNESCO. Uh, they decided that we needed a professional association. Uh, when André Camacquer was asked to prepare the draft uh, for this new association of a code of ethics, uh, when he produced the draft, we were rather surprised there was just one item, one article, and that was professional secrets. The professional secrets is the paramount consideration in the work of any interpreter. Our great quote, it's what Talleyrand said, uh, entre... Uh, Passer pour un imbécile et passer pour un bavard, il y a longtemps que j'ai choisi. Nous pensons que, à l'avenir, l'AIC devra assumer un rôle dans, bien sûr, la définition, la protection du titre d'interprète de conférence et euh, devra aussi euh, assumer un rôle dans la définition des conditions de travail des interprètes de conférence. Et cela ne pourra se faire que si nous revenons aux trois piliers du code d'éthique, euh, c'est-à-dire l'obligation de réserve, le secret professionnel et la solidarité entre nos membres. At its birth, simultaneous interpretation was an innovation made possible by advances in audio equipment technology and by the pioneering spirit of the first generation of simultaneous interpreters. Today, the breakthroughs are being made in video conferencing and remote simultaneous interpretation via satellite. Nous avons donc un matériel de plus en plus perfectionné pour interpréter. Nous avons un son bien meilleur qu'à qu nos débuts, c'est certain. Euh, les techniciens ont travaillé là-dessus. The delegate is now speaking in one of the six official languages of the UN. That would be English, French, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, or Arabic. Where you dial zero, you get the floor language. One is English, two is French, fire, and goes into the earphones for all the interpreters to hear. They then interpret it from that floor language into their particular language. That signal then comes back into the control room, and that's distributed to the delegates. Each delegates have panels where they plug in their earphones, and they have a selector switch so they can select what language channel they want to listen to. Now, what this control entails is if delegates are pushing the request to speak button on their microphone, uh, the computer will log on the screen the order in which the request to talk was pushed so that the chairperson can recognize the uh, delegates in the order they requested to speak. Uh, nous sommes en mesure maintenant d'interpréter à distance. Uh, Vidéoconférence, visioconférence, téléconférence, on n'est pas encore fixé sur le terme. Uh, qui permet, par exemple, aux interprètes de rester à New York et d'interpréter une, une conférence qui se déroule à Buenos Aires. Back in 1978, um, there was a conference uh, in Argentina on the technical cooperation between developing countries. And um, the UN wanted to carry out an experiment and see what they could provide interpretation from headquarters. We were sitting in our booth in New York interpreting what was happening there. And we had been promised that we would see the speaker on a screen. So there was a screen in the room and we could see when he was up on the podium. And they had um, TV cameras and we got satellite sound. Everybody said that it was all right. But for us, it was a terrible stress. We were very nervous. Uh, and I think there were only two of those um, tests, uh, one later on uh, with Vienna. 
The setup was a satellite communication direct from Vienna to New York. The uh, secretary of the committee at the very beginning of the meeting said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you will look around you at the interpretation booths, you will see that they are dark. The interpreters are not there. You will be hearing the voices of interpreters from New York City. Dans le temps, ce que nous avons pu constater, c'est une diminution de l'interaction entre l'interprète et les participants aux réunions. D'abord, à la consécutive, on était pratiquement en tête à tête, l'interprète était dans la salle. Puis est venue la simultanée, l'interprète est dans une boîte en verre. Puis on paie de moins en moins attention à la répartition des sièges dans la salle, donc parfois l'interprète ne voit pas l'orateur et ne voit pas non plus ce qu'il écoute. Maintenant, nous allons vers une ère où l'interprète ne sera même plus dans la salle, où l'interprète sera à côté. Et j'ai dit que techniquement, la chose est faisable, mais humainement, je me demande si elle l'est. Vous me permettrez d'évoquer enfin un projet qui me tient particulièrement à cœur, celui d'asseoir à nouveau, à l'occasion de cet anniversaire, l'universalité de notre organisation qui se reflète dans la diversité des cultures et des langues qui s'y expriment. Le pluralisme linguistique est essentiel. Il traduit le droit de chaque État membre de comprendre les autres, mais aussi le devoir qui est le sien de se faire comprendre. Como digo, la interpretación en Naciones Unidas es esencial. Uh, qué duda cabe que, en fin de cuentas, también se podría pensar o se podría imaginar unas Naciones Unidas que se hicieran todas en inglés. Pero creo que sería un empobrecimiento. Sería un empobrecimiento esencial. Uh, en el sentido de que únicamente se emplearían uh, conceptos, ideas, uh, provenientes de un único sistema eh, lingüístico y cultural. Eh, recientemente, por ejemplo, en la última conferencia de Pekín, eh, yo estaba leyendo los textos y me llamaba la atención con qué frecuencia se empleaban eh, conceptos y expresiones que provienen claramente del inglés y, y muy fundamentalmente, diría, de Estados Unidos, como empowerment, eh, gender perspective eh, o cosas así. Las Naciones Unidas es esencialmente multilateral y universal y no puede empobrecerse hasta el punto de quedar meramente como la expresión de un solo, una sola fuente eh, de ideas que sería la anglosajona. From the original 50 states that signed the charter of the United Nations, membership has grown to 185. Simultaneous interpretation has helped to make the United Nations more universal by enabling large meetings to proceed uninterrupted while delegates from all parts of the world speak any of six official languages. Consecutive interpretation is still used in many bilateral contacts and high-level meetings. Simultaneous interpreters also work for heads of state at such landmark global conferences as the UNICEF Children's Summit of 1991, the Earth Summit at Rio de Janeiro of 1992, and the 50th anniversary of the United Nations in 1995, where more than 100 heads of state spoke. For the first time in history, global problems are being debated in depth at a truly global forum. Interpreters have always existed. The role of the interpreter was described in a letter by Saladin to King Richard the Lionhearted in 1192. I do not understand your language, and you are ignorant of mine, and we therefore need a translator in whom we both have confidence. Let this man, then, act as a messenger between us. When we arrive at an understanding, friendship will prevail between us. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.